Welcome to the Wordy Pair Podcast. Your go-to hub for all things writing, world building, and the occasional dive into the weird and wonderful world of fiction. We're breaking down the barriers between you and your next great story. Whether you're a seasoned scribe or just scribbling your first sentences, We've got something for you. We'll be discussing everything from crafting compelling characters to dissecting the good, the bad, and the downright bizarre in the world of fiction. Okay, this script says you guys are eccentric. Isn't that just a three-syllable word for weird? No offense. So, whether you're in need of inspiration, a good laugh, or just a couple of weirdos to keep you company on your writing journey... You're in the right place. Thanks for tuning in to the Wordy Pair Podcast. All right. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is the Wordy Pair Podcast. As always, I'm Rudy. And I'm Justin. And today we're going to be talking about our favorite time travel story. Not no, not Back to the Future. Although that's a good one, uh, we're going to be talking about Steins Gate and Steins Gate Zero specifically. Well, I, it depends. Like so, so, so the initial idea I had, and 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 before I talk about that, let me just say that yes, Back to the Future is very good. It is excellent, and Steins Gate is so much better, so much better. Okay, I got it out of my system. Uh, <laughs> they've got. Uh, did we specifically want to talk about the characters, or do we want to talk about Zero and just how good a job it, it does of being a sequel to a time travel story? I think both of those are good topics. We didn't really narrow it down at this point, so we can start out with the characters. That involves fewer spoilers. And then if we... Well, well, no, because my, my point is... This is going to be chock full of spoilers, oh, no yes. matter how we tackle it. That's and fair. so, if we're going, if, if we're going to get into the characters, we have to jump back to the first part and not just zero, which means that we're basically going to be covering all of it. I mean, I'm all right with that. Pe- people who have people who are, Steins Gate came out how many years ago, and Zero came out how many years ago? It's you know it's, over it's, a decade. Yeah, it's 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 beyond its its uh, what you call it courtesy expiration date for. You know, spoilers. So you know, and and probably a lot of people who are listening to this are are interested in the the writing, the writing content, aspect, yeah. the writing aspect of it. And you know, since since <laughs> Steins Gate is such a niche thing, they might not be interested in getting into Steins Gate at all anyway. And so we can spoil it for them because, well, they're not intending to watch it because it's anime garbage. There's a there's probably a grain of truth to being able to get points across about writing by talking about the things one likes. So sure. this is the best way to do it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, of course. So so once again, you know, Steins Gate is some Japanese animation fun that we love. Well, so originally and... it was a visual novel. Yes. And, yes. it and was originally a visual novel. It's it's, it's, a, it's a it's a very long one. It's got a very complicated and um kind of difficult to difficult to understand method for deciding which ending you're heading to uh, involves picking replies for text messages that you get from characters in the game mostly yeah um and it's it's about time travel it's a it's a very fun science fiction story and I highly recommend it but if you're not interested in you know kind of that anime aesthetic that that's that's perfectly fine but uh, hopefully we can give you some ideas about uh, how it does time travel right, how it does characters right, because it is really possible to screw up time travel a lot, having inconsistent rules, things like that. But Steins Gate does a pretty, you know, I'm not going to say perfect, but I'm going to say it does a pretty decent job of being consistent with the rules it sets. Yeah, and not only that, but it also, it 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 closes off a lot of... Doors? It, it tries to close off any holes that yeah. the story might open as you're watching it. And there's a lot of things that happen that are kind of subtle, that if you're not paying attention, you might not, you might miss, oh, wait, that's how that, that, that's why this thing worked out. Yes. Or that's why this thing worked out. There's, there's a lot of points, especially in the show. Now, just for, uh, just for comparison's sake, we're, we're going to be talking about the show mostly because the largest part of what we're going to do here is talk about 
the way the characters are developed. Yeah. But the uh, the visual novel aspect of it, you know, in most cases, the longer work, the written video game visual novel style of Steins Gate is the more intricate, the more detailed, and it has multiple endings, which is perfect for a time travel story. Right, right. Having some kind of... Because what happens in the show is essentially the hero finds the bad path, and he has to go back and keep trying until he finds the good path. Right. Which is what happens when you play through the visual novel anyway. Right. Which is what happens when you play through virtually any visual novel, but the fact that this one specifically deals with time travel only makes it better. It's it's one of the best visual novels I've ever played, which for anyone listening who uh, doesn't know, a visual novel is pretty much a video game that is presented as a book with pictures and sound. Yes. But but you spend most of the time reading it, and sometimes it's got a little bit of choose-your-own-adventure where you make a selection. Right, right. So So we're going to do the show, and the reason we're going to do the show is because it's the quickest way to talk about how the characters are developed and things that you can do with characters to develop them as as you present a story. Yeah, and it's worth it's worth noting just one more time that that the show only covers a small fraction of what's in the visual novel. So it's possible to start with one, the show, and say, "Ooh, I like this," and then move from there to the visual novel. This is one of those rare visual novels that actually gets localized and and uh localized pretty decently and brought here to the US. Um, it's actually available on Steam now these days, so you know if you're looking for a good, albeit what would you call it, rather high level taste of what visual novels can offer, uh, that's a good place to maybe start looking. Uh, yeah, the visual novels for Steins Gate are available on tons of platforms. It's on Steam. It's on the Nintendo Switch. It's yep. on the PlayStation Four. Yep. I think they've got ports on Xbox and PlayStation Five. So if if you're looking to get into that kind of thing, or if you are, that's that's where it is. And you can't do much better than Steins Gate. I mean, there's maybe two or three visual novels the, I the like The thing better. about it is that it's not really an entry-level visual novel, you know? It's yeah, very it's, long. it's going to require some time. It's very and complicated. It's, to... it's got a very esoteric way of choosing, uh, of deciding what ending you're getting, things like that. I mean, it, you know, a good entry-level visual novel is something more like, oh, man... Uh, probably more like a kinetic novel because then then you get the feel for kind of the pacing for them. You know, there's there, there was that uh, yeah. kinetic novel World End Economica, which which is kind of a good, you know, entry level visual novel. Some of the so, some of the, the the Higurashi stuff is a good entry level visual novel because it's not trying to get you to solve the mystery necessarily. It's just a rip roaring good story. Umineko is kind of a mid level to to upper level uh, visual novel. It kind of depends on how into it you get, and Steins Gate is kind of an upper level visual novel because it's because it's got a lot of endings and it's very esoteric. Yeah, the the way that you find the, I mean, basically, I have never gotten all of the endings, and my plan is to just look up how to get them all because it, it you don't have a lot of clues as to what you have to do to get the, right, the various right. endings, and it's always annoying if you get a repeat ending. And there's a lot of steps too. Yeah. I, I, I think there's six endings in the original Steins Gate, and I believe four in Steins Gate Zero. Yes. Well, I, I, don't, so, I, don't, so I, don't, I don't know about those numbers, but that sounds about right. I'm pretty sure it's six for the first one, and they, there were less in the second one. Just there were, there were only like two or three selections that actually mattered in Zero mm -hmm. to get the different endings. Mm -hmm. It wasn't quite as intricate. Yeah. But let's jump into the show. So so the show actually does a great job because it's a time travel show. Yeah. They were able to do something that you can't normally do when you trans when you transition from a visual novel into a television show, which was that they were able to put bits and pieces from all the different endings into the show yeah. and and just like give you a taste of each one without actually giving them all to you or making them definitive endings. Like you get the good ending from the show, obviously. Right, right. But it it's peppered with things that would have happened if different decisions were made. Right. And this is... It's kind of important that this happens because due to the nature of time travel stories, a lot of the character development in the show comes to the forefront because of these varying timelines that the hero's on. So uh, 
I don't know. Should we start with the main characters? That sounds uh, like the way to go. Development or yeah. well, well, it might not be. I mean, we have a lot of side characters that are very important to the story. Well, I think I think getting the main characters and the basic the basic thrust of the plot down is probably the way to start, just so that people know where these things are coming from, as opposed to introducing a side character and talking about them for thirty minutes without anyone knowing who they're interacting with and why. All right, then let's talk about Okabe Rintaro. Yes, who AKA goes. Who goes by the mad scientist name of Hoenn Kyoma. Right. And he is, for want of a better word, a slightly, only slightly immature lead character who probably, you know, there, there's a... In the world of Japanese animation, there aren't too many male lead characters that really have distinct personalities. Mm-hmm. And he is definitely one of the better ones. Yes. There, there was a period in anime history where everyone was a uh, short, black-haired, medium-sized, average, wouldn't-stick-out-in-a-crowd high school student. And Okabe Rintaro, while he does have the black hair, because, I mean, he, he's Asian. How many non-black-haired Asians are there that aren't Russian? Right. Uh, he, he's, a bit, he's a bit tall. Of a, he's a taller character, which is already stepping outside the norm for that era of anime. And he's got a bit of a personality fluke that is actually a very deep part of his character. Yes. So when you're first introduced to him, he... I, I don't want to use the word slacker. It's that, That's not the right word. He's no, he's, he's wearing he's, a he's, lab he's, coat. He's like, he's, d- he's like deliberately... Deliberately... Uh... Like, he's deliberately immature. Deliberately immature and a little bit delusional, yeah. Yeah, not not even not even delusional, because as the story progresses, it becomes very obvious that he's not really delusional. He's he's got his the the well, reasons. So that... so that's one of the cool things about this character, right? The, the er, yeah. early on, the character seems to be kind of crazy and delusional, but all of that turns out later to be a cover for for, for that's there's basically a reason for him to be that way. Um, and and that, that's that's explored a little later in the original series. Yeah, so so he enters the story by visiting this um what was it, like a radio It's the uh, it's the it's the radio building in uh Yeah, the, in, the radio building in Akihabara. In Akihabara, yeah. Which just and recently was torn down. Oh, was it? Like yes. in real life? In real life. Oh, that's uh that's too bad. Must be because of all the things crashing into it. Yes. Yeah, so so uh the story kind of starts with him going to this scientific conference. He's He's got a bit of an interest in various scientific things, and he plays at being a mad scientist uh, with, with a pseudonym. That's where the Ho in Kyoma comes from. He, right. He tells everyone to call him call him by that name, and he he has a bit of a... There, there's this thing in Japan called middle schooler syndrome, right. where grown adults will uh, have an attribute in, mostly in anime, where they... Well, it, it's called, it's called middle of... schooler syndrome because it's typified by the middle schooler with all the crazy drawings and fantasies in their notebooks, right? Like, oh, you know, someone who yeah. kind of retreats to a to an internalized fantasy world because they either find the real world boring or they find themselves as outcast in it. So they kind of create, you know, kind of a backstory for themselves that gives them a little bit more, what would you call it? like a little bit more importance to the world. And some people maintain this kind of, you know, playful delusion longer than they probably should. Some people kind of cross the line from having it be a playful delusion that they rapidly grow out of to something that kind of defines them as a person. You know, it 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 it, it definitely can have its downsides, but uh but the the, the point is that uh, Rintaro is uh is is kind of he looks like he's kind of acting that way to begin with but you find out later on that he's actually pretty well grounded but he's doing this for the benefit of one of his friends he's he's doing it for the benefit of nearly all of his friends in some cases yes. uh, he one he in one in particular this... is the is the is the reason why he came up with the character to begin with though yeah yeah so so he'll do things like pull out his cell phone without turning it on and pretend that he's talking to some unknown person yeah about a secret organization and he he does it to the point of 
almost to a, the point of being obnoxious in public places where he'll be with his friends and they'll do something that's embarrassing him. So he'll pull out his phone and be like, hi, I think we've been comp compromised by the organization. They're, everyone's turned against me or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and everyone knows he's not talking to anyone on the, on the other end of the phone. And a lot of times they're playing the straight man to his fool where they will, where they'll be like, uh, where, where someone will snatch the phone and be like, this wasn't even on. And then he'll laugh at them and say, Oh, well it only, uh, that phone turns off unless it's, uh, got my own biogenetic identification right, or something weird like that. That's, that's his shtick. So he's a mad scientist that's bent on changing the ruling structure of the world. And he's fighting what he calls the organization, which is something that the depths of which only he knows so he can make up whatever he wants to given the circumstances. Right, right. This uh, this carries into his real life in subtle ways, such as going to scientific conferences, because he does have a genuine interest in science. Yeah. And in, in this particular case, he... Now, it's never really clear where he or any of his friends get their money from, so I assume that since I never see him working a job, he must have his, uh, he has a little apartment above a television repair shop right? that I'm guessing his parents probably pay for because he's a college student. This is well, he's one of a, the nicer. Is he a college student in the first one or is that only the second one? At least in the first one, I know that he's not in high school anymore. So he has okay. to at least be going into college, which I, I, I happens... think in the first one, he, I think in the first one, he hasn't gone to college yet. He's, he's doing that. That Ronin year thing. Yeah, yeah. So he's uh, he, he does end up as a college student at the beginning of the second one, but he is not your typical anime lead character, uh, high school person surrounded by his high school friends and the adventures that they're going to have. Right. He So he has this apartment, and he calls it his laboratory. Right. Uh, officially, it's the Future Gadgets Laboratory, where they make a bunch of absurd little things out of various prop equipment that they... Uh, that that he finds and adjusts, and it's actually, it's interesting that the inventions that the lab has come up with are things that they actually did sit down and build, even if they aren't very useful. Like right. in one episode, in I believe it's in Zero, he or no, maybe it was, it might have been the original. Uh, he shows another character uh, the invention of those little propeller things where you put it in your hand and it's a stick. And you spin it, and it's got helicopter blades, so it flies up into the air. Yeah. And he he has one that's got a built-in camera. And for the first time, this character is like, oh, this is actually a pretty neat idea. And, uh, and it's at a point in the story where he's being a little more serious with his friends. So he's mm -hmm. like, no, that's actually one of our worst ones. He's like, well, I mean, out of all the inventions, this one seems like it might have the most practical purpose. Right. And he goes, no, we actually forgot to design it with... The uh, so the camera doesn't rotate as well. So if you use it, you just see everything spinning around <laughs> rapidly, and, and that's and blurry. Yeah, yeah, and that's typical of the inventions of the future gadgets lab. So he, so there is a genuine interest there in science, and his best friend, or at least his best male friend, uh, since those are few and far between in anime, yeah, is this phenomenal computer hacker named Hashida Itaru. Yep. And he's phenomenal to the point that it becomes central to the story that he is able to do what he does because otherwise a lot of what happens absolutely would not work. Right. So so that's that's kind of like the starting point for this story where it's it you know about him and you know about his friend Hashida and now he's going to this radio lab for a scientific conference about uh, it wasn't specifically about time travel, was it? Uh, it just got brought up. No, it it wasn't. It was it was about. I think it was about storing memory as data or something, wasn't it? Well, th that was in zero. Well, no, but I, I think that I think that the 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 point was that the character, what's his name, uh, Makise Curis Chris, Curis's, Curis's father, has taken some of her ideas about the datification of memories. Yeah, in, even in the first one, I think that's still the topic because that's that's how. That's how their first time machine gets made, is it's not actually traveling them through time, it's traveling information comprising memories through time into their heads, right? So yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure that they're talking about something like that, you know, kind of a real topic. But then uh, 
I think it's Rintaro. Yeah, I, can't, I can't remember the catalyst that causes time travel to come up during that conference, but it's a, it's a room full of scientists and students. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're being given a presentation. Uh, one of the presenters is this young prodigy, 17-year-old Makise Kurisu, who is, she's already had papers published, already earned her PhD. She's, she's kind of got a semi bit of scientific fame for being in a magazine. Yeah, and uh, a lot of people are skeptical as to just how good she is. But you know, here she is. She's given her talk, and Okabe is there, and he kind of, sort of gets brings up time travel in a way in which causes the two of them to argue. Right, and it turns into a debate where it's it's interesting that Maki say you know she she shuts him down pretty quickly in the conversation, even though he does bring up several good points that. You know, most of the other people in the room might not have been aware of. She kind of puts the kibosh on that and yeah. upsets him a little. So, you know, he, he he wanders off and something happens. There's a couple of events that happen right at the beginning of this story. You know, he's there with a friend. Uh, his, his actual closest friend is another girl named Mayuri Shina. Right. And she, she goes by Mayushi all the time. So... She's there with him. She's not into the whole science thing. She's, I don't want to say she's a bimbo, but they, they kind of present her as that at first, which is part of the fun of the character development in this story. Mayushi is, a, is at first presented to someone who's not particularly intelligent, is kind of into collecting little cutesy things and toys. Yeah. Later you find out she's a big cosplay uh, nut, mm -hmm. but she's got a very soft spoken voice. She's very gentle. She's like the the kind and nurturing character uh, of the story. She's that kind of that stereotype going. Yeah, yeah. So she's there with him. He takes off for the conference. She's kind of wandering around doing whatever. You don't really get to see what she's doing. And things happen. Okabe is leaving the radio building. Well, and they, he... there, there's, there's, a bunch, there's a bunch of little points that get brought up that seem... Inco so this is an interesting thing that Steinsgate does is that is that insignificant or points that seem insignificant are brought into significance later? Like one of the things that happens is that is that while they're in that radio building, Mayushi gets a goes to a one of those coin operated dispensers, and it like you know it puts out little action figures, and she gets a little metal action figure, and it seems pointless, but it actually becomes an important element in the story later on. Yeah, because she loses it at one point. Yeah. Early on in the actually in that same part of the show in the in the right. same episode I believe she right. loses it and so they're hunting for it and during the hunt for it that's when Okabe finds uh, he opens a door and finds Makise Kurusu who he had just been talking to and she's dead she's been stabbed to death yeah so he's he's kind of in a daze from this and he walks he wanders out into the street and this is where weird things begin to happen. Yeah. There's this moment where suddenly there's nobody else on the street but him, and you get a little visual effect that kind of says something's going on in his head, and, and so he, he holds his head for a second, looks around, and, and then suddenly everyone's back, and there's this thing, like a satellite has crashed into the radio building, but yeah. it, it wasn't there before, now it's there, nobody seems to really notice and it's as if it had always been there. Yeah. And this happened right after Okabe sent a message to Hashida telling him that he just saw the prodigy scientist girl Makise Kurisu stabbed to death in the radio building. Right. So so this and this is all just the very first episode of the animated version no, of Steinsgate. No, they're they're Gate. setting the stage. You know, this is yeah, this the, is kind of the inciting incident. Yeah, so so this is this is a very important part of Everything that happens from here out, and then what do they throw at you? Bam! Second episode opens up. Hashida and Okabe are taking a walk, and who do they run into? Makise Kurisu. Right. And Okabe is so confused by this that he he approaches her and is investigating her, and she it kind of comes off like he's almost sexually harassing her. Like, like he actually puts hands on her because he doesn't believe she's real. Right. He saw her die, and there she is. This, through a series of circumstances that are not, best not left to... Not only did he see her die, but, like, before he leaves, there, there's... 
there's you know a, you know emergency people moving to like her body gets found before he before the time trap before the the head thing happens yeah yeah and this leads to through some freak coincidences makise ends up hunting him down and finding his future gadgets laboratory to find out what exactly it was that he thought he was doing and what the deal was with that whole grope fest yeah so i mean i i think he grabs her her coat it's not like yeah yeah it's, it, it, it's it, nothing it's, it's a it's a series that has some violence but it's actually pretty light on the on the on the fan service stuff yeah, what it all exists for is you get to see him kind of like just just putting a hand on her to make sure she's real. Yeah, and so this turns into a lot of it's kind of like comedic banter early on, where Maki Se and Okabe are very they're both very headstrong, and so yeah. they argue back and forth a lot. And she almost kind of just teases him with, you know, I could report you for sexual harassment for what you did back there. So what exactly is going on? Right. And in a way, that moment kind of leads to them becoming friends. It's not, they're not really, it doesn't seem like they're friends at first, but in a way that was, that was it. Like, like that was something that happened that caused Makise to have an interest in what was going on in their quote unquote lab. Right. And she joins them for the events that unfold next. Now, this is where Makise gets to see the Chunibyo or middle schooler syndrome side of, uh, of Okabe, where he he starts insisting that she refers to him as Ho and Kyoma, and she refuses to do this. She is the absolute straight man of this show, yeah. And she doesn't ever really play into his uh, nonsense in any way. But what happens is she discovers that uh, they're they're doing something that involves a microwave, bananas, and cell phones, and it it piques her scientific curiosity because they. F- they have a situation where they take food, put it in a microwave, and it turns into green jelly. Yeah. During this time, they think that it's just some fault of the microwave. Up until the point where they put an entire... Well, they take a banana off of a bunch of bananas, put it in the microwave, and this is what Makise witnesses that causes her to kind of freak out. Yeah. Because at this point in the story, Makise has written a few things about time travel as a scientist, but doesn't herself believe in time travel. She thinks that it's a, it's a dead end science. And she watches them put a banana in a microwave, turn it on. There's a bunch of electrical sparks and things. And all of a sudden there, the banana has reattached itself to the bunch of bananas on the table. And it is green jelly while the rest of them are normal. Right. And she has trouble coping with this at first because this, to her, proves that time travel is, in fact, a possibility. And so she actually takes off running. Like, she runs away from this at first. Yeah. When she comes back, it gets a little more serious between her and Okabe and Hashido, where they're like, okay, we got to figure out what this thing is doing. Because the research brain kicks on. Makise wants to know what's going on. Okabe really wants to dig deeper into this and find out what exactly he can get this thing to do. Yeah. And Hashida, well, he's, he's their tech guy. So <laughs> he, he kind of, he kind of rolls with whatever Okabe wants to do. To so be he's honest. a, he's an interesting character because, because he's, he's at the same time, he's like very irreverent and, um, he's got a very like, um, like he downplays his own, he, he downplays himself in kind of like a a way that most people would believe him to be downplaying himself, but at the same time he upsells himself in ways that people would just generally not believe. Like he you know, he calls himself a super hacker kind of thing. But, you know, most people would think, oh, he's just some, you know, 4chan dweeb kind of, you know, anime fan dude. He's very stereotypical in some ways, but in but but where it counts, he's actually very skilled at what he does. And uh that's an interesting because every everybody in the the, the 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 future gadgets lab is kind of a misfit. You've got Rin Taro who's pretending to be Ho and Kyoma. You've got Mayushi who is you know supposedly Kyoma's uh, hostage, and you've got you know Hashida uh, Daru uh, is his nickname, and he you know he he's he's a he's an internet guy, but like you know you kind of and, and they make these inventions that don't really work or do anything useful. And you kind of think they're, you know, they're all kind of lacking in smarts and skills and kind of just playing around. But 
Daru in particular, his skills are top notch, and you know you wouldn't think that that's the case. You know the way that he acts. Uh, he presents himself as a typical computer nerd that ha- has a penchant for hentai games and does a lot of stuff on internet forums. He uses internet slang, call- calling people the equivalent of noobs and whatnot. Yeah. Oh, I forgot what the word is that he always used for Suzuhara. He he called her like Joko or something. I don't know what that is, but they translated it as noob in the show. But actually, all of this is kind of a basis for what makes the characters. And actually, there's there's a lot of things about the show that are nice, like the subtle comedy. So you mentioned the hostage situation. One of the big developments in Okabe's character in the sh- in the story is that his best friend as a child was Mayushi. Yep. And when she was growing up, she had she had this grandmother she was really attached to. So when her grandmother died, she would go and visit her grave all the time, and she just didn't want to leave. And uh, at one point, Okabe interprets something that she's doing. Uh, she she's reaching her hand up whenever there's there's a lot of sunlight or anything in in the sky above her grandmother's grave, and uh, it, it's kind of like signaling to Okabe that she wants her grandmother to take her away with her. Yeah, and so he obviously he doesn't want his best friend to die, so he runs up behind her at one point while while she's visiting her grandmother's grave and just kind of kind of grabs her and tells her that you know she she can't go away because she's his hostage and this right. becomes the integral part of their relationship. So Mayushi freely tells people that she's Okabe's hostage, you know, not always realizing that the the fakeness of it between them is something that other people might misinterpret. Sure. So immediately when she tells this to Makise, she goes, oh no, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm just Okabe's hostage. It's all cool. Makise actually takes it seriously for a minute and, and she's like, do I need to call the police? What's going on here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, it, and it's very like, it's not overplayed where the situation gets too out of control and she's actually like dialing a phone and they're they're holding her hand and pulling back. No, no, she, yeah, she just yeah. makes the comment and that's the joke. That's the nice, subtle humor of it. And then the story moves on and things get cleared up pretty quickly. Yeah. There's several points where they do humor like that in the story. One of them is actually pretty dark, too. There is a character who, through the accident of... Well, not even an accident. Like, like they purposefully find a way to turn one of the characters from male to female. And uh, at, at this point, it's important to establish that Okabe is the only person who's aware when there's a change to a timeline. Yeah. So so everyone else doesn't know when something has changed, but he is always aware of the differences because he has some special thing going on in, in his head, which there's some semi-explanations for it later on, but we don't it's, need to it's, get into it's, that. It's, it's, it's an important story gimmick, is that your time-traveling character remembers his previous failures. Like, otherwise, otherwise you don't really have a time-travel story. Yeah, yeah. And there's there's a lot of tie-ins with things that happen in various parts of the story that say maybe that's not exactly what's going on, but we don't have to flesh that out too much. That That's right. something that you, you want to enjoy the show, you go watch it. But he... So he's aware that this person in a different timeline was a boy. Now, the thing about him was that he was a very effeminate boy, so a lot of people mistook him for a girl when he was a boy. Right. So this is the one time that even though he knows that they're on a different timeline because they've been messing around with the past, he goes so far as to say what he like for some reason, even though their intention was to try and turn him from a boy to a girl at his own request, for some reason, he just thinks that that's not a a, that that it didn't work. And so he so it kind of comes as a shock to him when everyone's convinced he's a girl and he actually grabs her and starts saying no no look I'll, I'll i'll show you and he's he's like touching her in places and slowly realizing he's wrong and so everyone gets really really angry with him and he when he realizes his mistake he has to go back and explain to everyone that no he was a boy in an alternate timeline and we changed his gender and so uh all of this is kind of like done for semi-comedy purposes but underneath that, there's a bigger story building up, which is much more serious in its undertone, which we'll get to as we go. But uh, we want to get back to the characters themselves. Yeah. So we've established enough about what happens at the beginning of the story to give an idea of, 
uh, you know, just how much time travel there is and just, you know, what kind of interaction some of the characters have. So the character of Okabe himself, from start to finish, he, he starts off as kind of a nonsensical, almost silly character who early on you can kind of tell he he has certain special caring for his friends. A- at first he seems like a jerk because he's treating his best friend Mayushi in ways such as uh, when she's buying that little toy, uh, she doesn't have the money for it. So she asks him for the money. So he puts on his mad scientist uh, facade and he buys the toy himself and says, no, I'm going to teach you a life lesson. I'm actually, this is actually mine, not yours. But then he ends up giving it to her anyway. He just kind of puts on the act for a little bit. Yeah. Because uh, you find out really quickly that this, above anyone else, he cares more about this character than pretty much anyone. And he cares a lot for all of his friends right. throughout the show. So once he sees Maki say Chris die, and then he sees her alive again, he he's kind of just glad that that wasn't a thing. But it doesn't it actually doesn't occur to him for a while that anything was really the result of time travel there. Right, right. And it, actually, for most of the show, he forgets that, which becomes very important towards the end of the show. You get to see him meeting all the other characters that he interacts with. There's a there's another female character who is this rich girl that works at a cafe and kind of is the center of what they call moe culture in the mm-hmm. show. Mm-hmm. She's she's a little bit famous in the district of Akihabara. It turns out her family owns most of Akihabara, according to the show. And she likes to be amongst the the cute cosplay culture of everything. So she's good friends with Mayushi. Because right. Mayushi is big into cosplay, and they actually work together at this cafe. That character in particular, oh, what was her name? Ferris. Yeah, Ferris. Well, that's her nickname. I can't remember what was it. Then Risa they call her or... that ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, they they call her Ferris most of the time. We'll call her Ferris. So she's the one character that completely one hundred percent plays into Okabe's Hoenn Kyoma Mad Scientist Act. She yeah. will actually, she'll actually make bombastic claims of her own when they're talking together about how she's worried about the organization encroaching and she she plays along with him essentially right right so when those two go at it she actually might be the worst one between the two of them because even in the moments where okabe gets serious she sticks to that that whole shtick yeah. And especially in the moments where Okabe starts to show a, a bit of uh, uh, sadness or trouble in what he's doing, she will try to draw him back into a, you know, a happier side of himself. Yeah, right. And and she does this to the extent that, you know, when, once you reach the sequel, when they get into Steins Gate Zero, you do get to get, get a glimpse of them in the far future, where... Really bad stuff has happened. In in one instance, World War Three has broken out. And in another instance, the equivalent of CERN, spelled with a C instead of an S in this universe. Other way around. In, or, or, yeah, the other way around. As in, as in the Large Hadron Collider CERN of our world. Right. They are actually experimenting with time travel, and they are trying to stop anyone else from doing so. So... Everyone in this little group of friends essentially becomes a, a, a terrorist outfit or, and is hunted by CERN in the future. Right. So even in the future, when you get to see Ferris, you know, they're, they're, they're on a mission running from these people that are trying to kill them. She still ends her sentences with the cute cat like Nya when, they're, when she talks, and she still talks to Okabe, calls him Hoenn Kyoma. Right, and right kind of refers to the enemy as the organization that they were pretending to fight when they were younger. Uh, which is which really makes her a pretty interesting character because she's got a lot of problems of her own and she spends most of the show, uh, without you being aware of it, she's running from a lot of those problems. Yeah. E- each character has their own unique little thing about their past which leads to the problems of the show. So, so this is another aspect of Okabe playing into his friends to kind of keep everyone happy essentially like like they they get along good the whole group seems to get along well because of the the presence of okabe right and 
it, one of the one of the biggest instances of this is the character that I mentioned that has uh, that looks like a girl but is a boy, which is the running joke. They they present him early in the story as one of the most feminine people that Okabe knows, and then he, he's giving an, sort of an internal monologue, and he says, "But he's a dude," right. and he he does this throughout the show. And I think in I think in Zero at one point even Mayushi makes a joke of, about, "But he's a dude." Which right. is kind of funny because she says it as though she's copying Okabe, but he never actually says that out loud. So she just knows that's what he's thinking. <laughs> right, right. Okabe calls him Rukako. His name is Ruka, but he adds the he code. He lives on the second is... floor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okabe adds the code to the end of Ruka's name because ko is a uh, feminine ending to a japanese name so you have like you have like rukako just makes it more it it, it makes it a girl's name name, right and and he's well aware that a lot a lot of a lot of female given names in japan end with ko yeah well like in ranma one half they would refer to the female ranma as ranko Uh uh-huh in in this particular instance the character in question knows that he's that he appears very feminine to everyone and he actually Instead of dressing like a temple priest, because he works at a shrine, or his father runs a shrine, and he dresses as the female Miko instead of a male priest at the shrine. Right. And he's he's very slender, and he's not particularly strong. And one of the ways that Okabe is a bright spot for this particular character, he he gives he he basically goes out and buys this crappy little sword. At one point, you don't get to see this in the show. It's something that's already established, but you find out he bought a he bought a fake sword, and he gives it to Rukako, and tells him that it's a magical sword and that he needs to train with it every day, and yeah. he will often show up at the shrine and ask Rukako about how his training is going. And Rukako will he's a younger person, so I think he's still in high school. He will diligently be shown practicing with the sword swinging over and over and over again which when we get to talking about his character development we'll we'll, we'll kind of streamline a lot of it here because i know we're we're filling a lot of time with okabe but yeah he's you get to see that there is a payoff for a lot of the things that happen with all of these characters in their past even in the future when things get really dark for all of them so essentially to kind of speed things up here Okabe realizes he can travel in time. They experiment with the time travel only to find that something goes horribly wrong and they end up trapped on a world line where Mayushi's death is fated and a certainty. And Yeah, so there's a there's a concept that shows up here which is called what they 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 translate it as convergence. That basically a large number of world lines all converge on one event and they all try to kind of they all, they all kind of and they they all kind of have that event as a common element of them there's a there's a tool that they have that kind of tells them a number that that describes the world line that they're in and if that number is below 1 then they're in one set of world lines that has this this uh death of mayushi convergence and if they're above 1 then they have a non mayushi death convergence happening uh yeah and the convergence meter that they get actually comes from another character who is easily my second favorite character in the show. I'm actually surprised that Okabe is such a good character that he's my favorite. Yeah. It's it's there's a lot of shows where the main character is meant to be the best one, but you've got a whole lot to pick from in in this cast and Yeah. The top two characters for me were definitely Okabe and uh Suzuhara. But we'll get to Suzuhara, and we'll also get to John Titer, which, yes, you heard that right. This story has has to do with the internet legend of the time traveler John Titer, who right. appeared on the Art Bell show back in, what, 1998? I don't remember when, but something like that, yeah. Yeah, so so this this show actually ties in to several internet conspiracies, and it's a fantastic job they did of tying all the events together. Like, they used real timeline stuff, that happened back right before around 2000. They, they kind of based the story around those events. But Okabe is the only character that can really tell when time has changed. 
And so he's the only one that knows when this meter, when the number is different. Because to everyone else, it's just like, that's the number it always was. But if right. he goes to a timeline that's different than the one he's on, he sees slight changes in the number. It's it's a it's a single digit at the beginning with a long decimal afterwards. And right. it's usually the decimal that's changing. And he has to get it to change on the uh the full number to to really make any sort of proper divergence happen where they can escape the timeline that forces Mayushi to die. Right. Now at first he thinks that she dies and he's gonna go back in time and save her. Uh they they built a contraption using Makise's Makise's specialty was neuroscience, and part of the story, as you mentioned at the beginning, revolved around her figuring out a way to capture data from, from a human brain. And then they used the time machine, which they had figured out how to send emails to the past. Oh, they used the time machine to compress data from the human brain and send it back into the past version of a person so that right. they have their future uh, knowledge. So, so it's it's not really that the person is time traveling. It's that the data that's in their brain is time traveling. Yes. It's an interesting I, idea because it, it sidesteps a lot of the problems that like a lot of the time paradox stuff because there's never actually a second version of that same person in the in the timeline there there's an exception to this that comes up later on but but the idea is that they're yeah. just sending they're just sending memories back through time and they have like you know there's there's a few interesting rules like it can only go back so far i think it's like 2 weeks or something like that i think it was 2 days is it just 2 days okay yeah it becomes 2 weeks later on for for steins gate 0 we're still in the initial steins gate here so makise figured out a way to help her, between her and uh, hashida they figured out a way to develop this machine so that they could send an intelligence back in time. I, I always thought it would make an interesting side story if they, because uh, they, they never actually do this in the show or the visual novel, I think. But given that they're just sending data back, I thought it would be funny if they had a side story where one of the other characters picks up Okabe's phone when it rings yeah. and he ends up in someone else's body, but they didn't do that one. That, that would be some no. good fan fiction. Maybe, sure. maybe I'll make that happen sometime. There's he goes back in time and tries to prevent her death by, you know, shifting the players around so that they can't possibly be where she dies, only to discover that no matter what he does, somehow Mayushi dies. She gets pushed in front of a train. She has a heart attack. She she gets shot. She gets stabbed. All kinds of stuff. It, just every every horrible thing that you could ever imagine seeing happen to your best friend. Uh, Okabe is forced to witness and this is where his character growth really starts to get both dark and pretty deep because you get to see the extent that he's willing to go to, not just for Mayushi, but for any of his friends. It becomes right. very important later on that he's not just doing this for her. He is more willing to sacrifice himself than anyone else in his friend group to the point at which at one point he, he sort of gives up. And he decides that he's just going to keep reliving the same two days over and over again so that nobody ever dies and they stay happy. One of the other characters is... Well, I, I guess we have to introduce her properly now. Suzuhara is a character that takes a part-time job at the TV repair shop below them. Right. And there, there's a couple of things that happen while you're at the beginning where, where you think that she's kind of playing along with the mad scientist thing that Okabe does. Yeah. And, and like this, this for like two or three of his little antics, you see her play along and you're like, Oh, okay. She's, she's kind of like Ferris in that sense. But then she starts saying things that give you a clue that something else is going on with her right up until the point where she start where she meets Makise for the first time. And she's immediately on the defensive. And for anyone that's watching it, there, I think most people at that point realize that something is going on with her where she's aware of something about time travel. Yeah. And just because there's, there's no reason for her to make something up like Okabe is doing. So when that moment happens, almost like my immediate thought was, oh, wait, she's, she knows something about the time travel. And later in the show, when things start to get really out of control, she has to confront both Okabe and Makise. And bring them to the radio building where the satellite has... They've got, they've got that satellite that crashed into the side of the building. It's just sitting there. Nobody's doing anything with it. Right. And, and she brings them there and she tells them... Uh, well, well, that's when she pulls from her backpack the device with the numbers on it and gives it to Okabe. 
and he's like, well, what is this? She goes, that's a divergence calculator. So you can, you can tell when uh, the world line has shifted. And he goes, well, who built this? He, she goes, you did. <laughs> and right, th- right. then she tells them that, well, she brings them up to the, the satellite that's crashed and tells them this is her time machine. She is from the distant future where all the dystopian stuff has happened. Right. Uh, in this particular instance, it's CERN has taken over the world using time travel and they're trying to eliminate all of the threats. And she tells them that she is the time traveler, John Titer, which these characters had mentioned early on in the show. Okabe was on the internet boards discussing things with John Titer at one point. And he, he knew all about the things that happened in 2000, where John Titer appeared on the Art Bell show claimed to be a time traveler from the future, told this wild story and, and opened the forum for people to ask questions. Well, it turned yeah. out it was this little girl that was working part-time in the TV repair shop underneath him all this time. And right. she knew about all of these characters, which is where you start to see how they're all tied in together. So, so it's important, it's important just to know that that's who she is because you end up with Okabe trying to repeat time over and over a la Groundhog's Day, only for her to confront him at one point and tell him, hey, you're looking really tired, and I've seen this before. And yeah. so so she tells him she can recognize when someone has given up hope and is trying to just relive the same time periods over and over again. She goes, you know, she, she basically stops him. Now, this isn't in the show. I, I realized this rewatching the show recently. I don't know why I thought it was in the show, but in the visual novel, you get a whole scene where she stops him and, and says, how many days have you repeated? And he can't even give her a count. He's been doing it so long. Yeah. And, and so you know, she, she tells him, you have to stop doing this. You're, you're going to destroy your own mind. Right, right. And she, she can't really stop him because she's not the one that can tell when the future changes. She's just like, you, you, you have to, you have to do something about this because I'm not even going to remember that we had this conversation and it's just going to get worse for you. Right. And, you know, she gives a few brief stories about people she seen try this before and it always ends up with them going insane. Yeah. So that, that's actually one of the endings to the visual novel, I believe is that he just decides to keep repeating the days. But, yeah. You yeah. Know, sk- skipping all that. This th- this gets painted very briefly in the show where he kind of drives himself crazy repeating the days over and over again till he just can't take it anymore and he he has to he has to approach Makise who over the course of the show they went from kind of not kind of butting heads all the time to working together to solve a lot of problems you you well, get it's, to see it's her it's her it's her ideas about you know transferring digitizing human memories that that is the basis for their time machine so she's she's kind of she kind of she starts out very skeptical of them and then later on when push comes to shove she works with them and and they accomplish a lot of things together uh yeah yeah and one of the greatest moments in the show as far as okabe's character development it's it's more about what you don't know than what develops with his character uh for instance when they're coming up with the idea for uh, sending the emails to the past. It's actually, they're all sitting around talking about how they can experiment with this. And Okabe is the one, much to even Makise's surprise, that, I mean, he has a stroke of genius about sending emails to the past. And he even has another stroke of genius later on. Which I can't quite remember how it played out. Yeah, But he kind of sparks the idea for sending sending someone's thoughts back in time. Like, right. like they're all talking about how there's really not much more they can do with what they've invented. And he does his fake mad scientist laugh and says, no, we're moving on to human experimentation. And Makise is just like, what? And right. you, you almost get a sense that Makise is the scientific genius of the group, but Okabe is not anywhere near normal. He is quite above average. He, and, and probably an equal genius in his own right to Makise Chris, who is both a genius and very well trained in her science. Right. So, so they, they kind of work together well, even if they're butting heads, just because they both have this tenacity for, you know, learning something new or just 
just delving into anything that uh, they can't explain and trying to figure it out. Right, right. Further, further development of Okabe comes from just how quickly he he ingratiates Suzuhara into their lives, even after he finds out she's a time traveler. What ends up happening is, after going crazy for a while because he can't save Mayushi, Okabe approaches Makise and he's like in tears, and she's like, "Look, I'll I'll help you. I know we butt heads all the time, but you know, she she offers to do whatever she can to help." Yeah. And he tells her about Mayushi constantly dying. So so she works out that, well, wait a minute. We sent all these emails to the past. Maybe what we have to do is reverse these emails. Right. And for the sake of brevity, we won't go too much into the detail of the emails. But one character, Rukako, wanted them to send an email to the past because he got tired of being uh, looked at as this very effeminate boy. So he he got them to send something to the past to convince his mom to have a different diet because he thought maybe she would have a girl instead. And so he does end up being a girl. Ferris, her father died when she was younger, and she wanted to fix that, which is one of the strangest things that uh, happens because at one point they're in Moe culture Akihabara with all of it. Akihabara is a a real place in Japan full of a lot of, like, uh, nerdy stuff, essentially. Yeah, it's it's a it's nerd central computers, anime. It's just a whole section of Tokyo that's full of renowned for this. Kind of yeah, stuff, yeah, it's renowned for it. Very, very anime culture kind of thing. And her email was to send a message back to save her father, which causes Akihabara to turn into just a normal town because right. she ends up spending time with her father instead of redecorating the city, basically. Mm hmm. I can't remember who else. There's there's another character whose email was well, we we'd get too deep in the story if we went off in the whole IBM 5100 thing. So Yeah, there there's a, there's a lot of really neat little details that are like callbacks to to real things or, you know, stuff that happened in the past. And and there's a lot of fun little threads that all get tied together in the end. It's yeah. a really it's a, it's a really good story in that respect. It's really well written because they they do a good job of, of tying things together when a lot of time travel stories kind of go off the rails. And so Okabe is confronted with every single one of his friends and having to make terrible choices on their behalf. In the case of Ferris, he tells her that she changed the, the past so that Akihabara would be a normal city. And he, he has to let her know that Mayushi, who she's friends with, he says her death is certain unless we can get back to the world line we started at. And right. this puts Ferris in the situation where she has to choose between her dad and her best friend. And what ends up happening is, is so, th- so this is kind of where the, the ability that Okabe has that he can see, he can remember different timelines. He calls it the reading Steiner. And he starts to see that his friends have a smaller version of this ability as time goes on, because Ferris is tells him at this point that she remembers a town where her father was a time where her father was dead and she couldn't understand what it was if it was like a weird daydream or something and now he's telling her that this was a real thing and so she decides that since it's likely she'll remember some of what happened she's had 10 good years with her father so she'll help him turn the clock back and change sending the email so that that Mayushi can live because you know what a horrible choice you got to make. It's like, well, my technically she was alive and her father was dead, so uh, she's going to reset things there, right? And and of course they have to. <laughs> the Rukaku one is nice because when you find out that Rukaku was uh, was actually in love with Okabe, and as a girl she confesses this and says that she's more than willing to to help them get things back to save Mayushi, but. She she kind of blackmails Okabe, saying, uh, telling him to take her on a date at least once before they change it back. Yeah. So, so they end up going on a date, and it just goes terribly. This is one of the better moments of Okabe's character development. He tries doing the normal date thing. He dresses up nice, tries taking her to a nice place. They don't really hit it off that well, and two of the other characters are spying on them, watching everything go down. And at the end of the night... Uh, they realize that maybe it just, it didn't quite work out that well, but 
at least they got to do it. And he leaves. They go back to the lab. They're going to change everything back. Now, they're doing this to save Mayushi. But in the middle of right. this, before they change Rukaku back to, to a boy, he, he kind of just slams his fists down, stands up and says, hold the experiment. Something I, I have to fix something. And he runs back to Rukaku. And he, he realizes that what they had wasn't summed up in some little date that they were going to go on, that the real date would have been them being themselves. And he he tells her to go get the, the sword that he gave her. And they spend a few hours with just the two of them, uh, with, with him training her to use the sword. And that's the real date. That's where they have mm-hmm. the real fun. And yeah. he, he basically treats her like, like he's always treated her, but they just hang out and get to have one last moment of them spending time together with him as a girl. And, you know, this makes her happy. This makes Okabe feel good about fulfilling his end of the bargain, which was to take Rukako on a real date. And then they go back and change Rukako back. And, And of course, the whole time after that, Okabe is saddled with the notion that, well... He, I don't think they ever outright say that as a boy he loves her, but but Rukako is very affectionate for towards Okabe even as a boy. Like like he really respects Okabe. Just to touch a bit on his character development, when they do get a chance to go to the dystopian future, you get to find out that all of that sword training that Rukako had done turned him into a still very effeminate looking person, but he is an incredible warrior. Yeah. Sporting guns and a sword, and he ends up saving all of them and leading to Okabe being able to return back to the past. It, Rukako actually dies saving them in one of the more dramatic moments of the show. But, you know, he dies in Okabe's arms and is more than happy to do it so that, because he, he trusts Okabe so much. He, like his dying words are something along the lines of, I know you'll save us all. Yeah. And and it works out great for them to just get the motivation to say, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to save the whole world. I've, I've kind of been going on a lot. Do you want to talk about one of the other characters in terms of development? I mean, we, we haven't really, I guess we haven't really talked about Okabe's development. He just is this character throughout the show. And he well, does it's one of those things where, where uh, Okabe is interesting because... He doesn't have much character growth per se. It's just his character is revealed more and well, more to the. He he has the character growth that he like. He has, so so he's the he's the player character in the visual novel, and so he becomes what a happens hero to him as time goes. Is basically is basically that he he number one he learns that there's kind of like actually some kind of usefulness to his mad scientist putting on airs thing. Um, you know, he, he, he gets traumatized from the, from the pain of going back through the same couple of days over and over and over again, you know, in, in, in Steins Gate Zero. So, so, so the interesting thing about Steins Gate Zero is that it doesn't start from the good ending of Steins Gate. It starts from one of the bad endings. And, uh, in that ending, basically Okabe gave up on trying to save Kurisu and decided to just kind of go and be a regular college student again. And, uh, you know, that, that's kind of the, that's kind of the development between Steins Gate and Steins Gate Zero. And, and then one of the fun points of Steins Gate Zero is when he realizes that he needs to take on the, the garb of Kyomo once more. And, uh, and uh, there, there's some fun stuff there. It's, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, in the show, every character gets a little slice of development, but nobody gets a whole lot. One of my favorite characters actually is, uh, is, uh, Mr. Braun, yeah, um, <laughs> who is is an int- who who is a, who is who is the guy that owns the television repair shop under their under their uh, so called laboratory, and he's he's an interesting character because he has kind of like a double a double life going on, but at the same time he's he's very dedicated to his daughter, um, and he runs the TV repair shop and. And they use him to some really uh, good effects in both the original series and in Zero too. He he does a lot of cool stuff in Zero. I mean, it's one of those it's one of those shows where you really get a little taste of this very long, very intricate visual novel, and they kind of give you just enough to 
to feel it's an interesting it's an interesting balancing act because there's a lot of different ways to do this right like a lot of shows will just pick one you know a lot of shows that that adapt a visual novel will simply pick one route and show that route maybe you know a, a little hint of this one or a little hint of that one but you actually get some pretty decent chunks of a bunch of them in in the show and and the and the reason that it works so well is cuz it is a time travel uh story and, and therefore nothing Nothing contradicts anything else because they're happening on different timelines. It's um, you know, it's it's one of those shows where it seems really like um, it it does a really good job of changing the mood. Uh, you know, it starts out very lighthearted and happy, and then it goes through some really dark material in the middle of the original series, especially where j- just things get very desperate and very uh very dark. You know, you have the the character Kiryu Moika who is is uh, a, a, an interesting character because she seems very harmless at first, and then she turns out to not be harmless, and then kind of the goal is to is to prevent her from not being harmless again. It, it's there, there's a lot of fun stuff going on there, and 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 I haven't seen the original series in a while, so I'm I'm kind of a little bit fuzzy on some of the stuff that's going on there. But like the overall effect is is very positive because you have a lot of characters that really really care for each other. Uh, and have a good have a good relationship, and you know the the whole it, it's one of those it's one of those kind of like um, be careful what you wish for stories too because the whole way, the way the whole way it starts is that they come up with this D mail thing right they can send a, a text message or even like a beeper message back in time and that's how they do all these all these neat things to kind of like fix a problem in each character's life. And then they have to go to the trouble of of repairing every single or, or or of undoing every single one of these, and that's a fun thing too, right? Like, in a lot of time travel stories, you 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 kind of just you kind of just end up somewhere where things are fixed by doing one big thing, and instead they've got a lot of really small things that have to be done to to return things to how they were, kind of thing. And 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 there's there's a fun element of of that also being kind of a kind of a false lead in some ways because it, it, you know it turns out that that the one event that they really need to fix to get the good ending in the original Steins Gate is is Makise Kurisu dying after you know after they've they they've fixed all these other things that they messed around with with the D-mails. It's just a really fun story. I guess I got to go back to it again because I haven't in a while. Well, in in short, you know to to talk about Okabe's journey he he sees Makise die, and then she's alive again. And then they start fiddling with time. He finds out Mayushi is destined to die in the timeline they're on. He goes back and fixes all the problems. Kiryu Moika's problem was particularly interesting because they had to deal with her buying a new phone, and so they weren't sure. They didn't know what she sent back through time, so hers right. was particularly tricky for them to deal with. And it actually, uh, you know, she's she's a semi-bad guy in the show, She's actually the first one that kills Makise. She shows up to collect a computer. No, not a computer. Um, Mayushi. She shows up to round everyone up. She actually works for CERN. Right. And she shoots Mayushi. And when they go back in time, or when Okabe goes back in time, he actually, on one occasion, he he shows up and sticks a gun in her back. Well, not a real gun. He's He's like faking it. But he essentially tells her that he traveled back in time and he needs information from her. And and, and another point, he goes back in time when he's trying to fix her email. <laughs> he actually attacks her to get her phone. And he's kind of got this, th- he, he does this dialogue about, you know, he doesn't really have much sympathy for her because she shot Mayushi. But after he says that to, to, the, uh, to the viewers, he kind of he kind of backtracks on that because she's just she's a mess of a person she thought that she was doing something for someone who really cared about her only to find out that she was being dropped like a bad habit at the end of this is this is another element of kind of like toxic japanese culture that gets dealt with in this show where you know some people end up in you know very isolated and and they and they kind of you know retract inside into into their you know what's it called like a like a like a a, a hikikomori or a neat kind of thing where where people yeah. will withdraw people with, with withdraw into their own little shells a lot and this is a this is a common topic 
in a lot of things. And she's one of these characters that kind of did this. And because she's so desperate for a human connection, she kind of picks up on the, the first thing that, that, you know, she, she, she's vulnerable. And that makes her both, you know, sympathetic, but also uh, a very, you know... Very manipulatable uh, character. Well, well, well it's not... The, the, she, she's sympathetic, but she's manipulatable to the point of doing great evil. Yeah, she, she. I mean, she's an absolute monster when it comes down to it. At one point, Okabe right. asks her, you know, if this person asked you to kill someone, would you? He already knows the answer because he witnessed her shooting Mayushi, but she she looks him dead in the eye and says, yes, I would. I would do anything yeah. for this person. And that's right. the person that, that lets her go and just cuts her off completely. And she freaks. She, she, she just loses it. She doesn't, she, she's like crying on the floor and uh, she's desperately sending messages to this person who is not ever going to respond to her again. Right. Okabe has to steal the phone because he's trying to figure out what message she sent. You know, he ends up telling her, look, I, I'm a time traveler. I watched you kill yourself three days from now. I'm your only hope of fixing this because if I don't, you will kill yourself. And he ends up getting her to calm down a bit, but she, she absolutely freaks out. Like he takes her phone and runs out of her apartment. He's holding her door closed. She's throwing tables at the door. She's kicking the door. She's just screaming at him. And up until that point, the only way she really communicated with everyone was she might whisper here and there, but she only ever texted people. Even if she was in their presence, she would not talk to people. Yeah, That's right. how shut in she was. Uh, which, you know, that covers a lot of her character development. I mean, her, her whole thing is that she Well, she, she's interesting because because in the good timelines, or even in like the, the semi-good timelines, she doesn't she hasn't done anything wrong. And so one of the aspects of Rintaro's character is that he remembers seeing her do these horrible things again. And, you know, it, it traumatizes him to the point where, you know, she shows up in Steins Gate Zero and he's like, something bad is going to happen. Something bad is going to happen. Something bad is... And of course, something does. But, lo- like, the point is is that, like, like she's never actually... In, in the timeline that they're in, she's never done anything to harm, harm anyone. And yet, at the same time, you know, she's the source of this terrible trauma for, for Rintaro. And she's, she's a legitimate potential source of danger in the future. And, and, and you know, we as the as the viewer or reader get to, we, we know that. And so like, you know, there's a, there's a fun emotional thing there of like, what do you do? What do you do for, with a, with a person who isn't bad yet, but you are pretty sure isn't, is, is going to become bad later on if, if something isn't done kind of thing. It's a fun, it's a fun uh, archetype to play around with. Yeah. In the, in Moika's case, especially it's, um it's interesting that, you start off watching Steins Gate Zero after knowing what she did to Mayushi on a different timeline in the original show. Right. And that is that is Okabe's first reaction is, uh, what is she doing here? I can't trust her. And then we'll get into Hashida in a minute, but because of the work, kind of work Hashida does that you never get to see in the show, he actually has connections to Kiryu Moeka in Steins Gate Zero, which surprises right. Okabe because they hire her to help track someone down. Yeah, and then there's kind of she she's kind of you feel like she's this sort of Damocles that like she's going to drop at some point and you just know it and, and and so that adds a lot of really good tension to the story because you're not sure how things are going to go down but you know that things are going to go down. Yeah, and Okabe doesn't really tell Hashida what she did in another timeline but he does tell Suzuhara which I I guess we can with, with well well let's get one more thing out of the way. So yeah. So essentially, in the original Steins Gate anime, Okabe becomes this character who is willing to do anything to save his friends. And, you know, he even if he goes a little mad, he, in the end, does everything possible to get the best ending, we'll say. Now, one of the things that happens close to the end of the first series is he realizes all too late that the last thing that they need to change is the email that he sent to Hashida telling him that Makise died because yeah. that's that's the linchpin of everything. If they do right. not change that, then they're stuck in the world where Mayushi dies. But if they do change it, then they're stuck in a world where Makise Kurisu uh, gets stabbed to death in the radio building. And right. towards the, like almost at the very end of the show, they get down to that point and Maki says, just like, so I guess we just got to change that one last email. What was it? And that's when he realizes the mistake he made, that he is now stuck with this choice. 
Yeah. Now, in the original show, they do wrap that up and they do show what happened to solve that problem and they do get the good ending. Steins Gate Zero takes place in the time between, say, the, like the last two minutes of... It, it kind of takes place between the second to last episode of the original show and the last episode of the original show. Right. Steins Gate Zero is when they chose to save Mayushi and let Makise die. Makise right. talks Okabe into le letting him die, and then immediately after that, our John Titer character from the future, uh, it, it, she comes back, and she's different this time. Not Not different as a person, but essentially in the first sh show, she came back to try and prevent the bad things that CERN was doing from happening. Right. Since all of that gets erased by the end, she never came back and, and caused any of that to happen, so Okabe is the only one that knows any of that happened. However, in Steins Gate Zero, she comes back immediately after Makise Kurasu dies, and she's telling them that World War III breaks out, and so now she's trying to prevent that. So this is essentially a different Suzuhara. And right. at this point, they've established a few things about her. So her character in brief. She's a time traveler from a future who had to live as essentially a very uh, young warrior, and she's trained. She's very militarily trained. She can do hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. Uh, she knows how to use guns and weapons. She has a, a little bit of shell shock. They show her in the show several times. She sees an airplane overhead and, and freaks out for a second and then catches herself and has to yeah, remind yeah. herself that she's in a peaceful time. She, it, it turns out that she's the daughter of Okabe's best friend, Hashida Itaru, right. who, as it turns out, is in the future the inventor of the time machine. Because of all of his experience with the time machine microwave thing that they built, in the future he's able to figure out how to build the machine that Suzuhara uses to go back in time and try to change things. Right. So she lets them in on how they're all freedom fighters in the future that are trying to find a way to prevent World War III. She's their last-ditch effort. She has come back to try and convince Okabe to go back and save Makise, which seems to be the problem of this timeline. He's reluctant to do this because he knows that means Mayushi will die. But Suzuhara is trying to convince him that there's a way that they can save both of them. Yeah. Which... It actually, it's almost, if it wasn't such dire straits, it would be funny how it works out. Because at the end of the original show, you see Okabe from the future telling his past self in his mad scientist character the things he needs to do to fix everything. And that's yeah. how they get the good ending in the original show. But in Steins Gate Zero, when he sets all this up, you actually find out that it was only the very recent Okabe who accidentally ended up in the future. And is he is from, what what was it, like 15 years in the future or something? Yeah, yeah. He is from that far in the future, but he only really has the memories of the Okabe that he's talking to in the past because something went wrong with their uh, phone microwave machine to where he lost all of, where all of his memories were replaced with the younger version. So he has to work out that plan on the fly while he's in the future to figure out how right. he can solve all of these problems and even fool his past self. And, and it's really funny when you go back and watch the original and you're, you're seeing him send this video back from the future and you're like, oh, wait a minute. Technically, that's only him from like two minutes from now. <laughs> and and that, just, that just makes it better that he did the whole mad scientist persona and everything. Yeah. But, but that's the kind of character he is. He, he goes through all this hardship to save all of these characters. He maintains this facade that brings everyone together. And this is probably the best moment of character development he has in the entire show. When yeah. through the entirety of Steins Gate Zero, he is a broken man. Suzuhara can't convince him to go back in time and try to fix things. Another character shows up who worked with Makise in their lab in America and reveals that they've got an AI that has a lot of Makise's memories using her own theories that they used to build the time machine to send memories yeah. back. Well, well, they, they also used that to build an AI that acts a lot like Makise. So Okabe also ends up interacting with her a lot, and he's kind of juggling this whole... He knows he's that, it, that it's not the real Makise, 
but it's also all of her memories and it's a very realistic AI. So it kind yeah. of is the real Makise. And he actually ends up relying a lot on her as well, even though she's just a computer. Right. This dynamic kind of sets the stage for him really wanting to do something to save Makise in the end. And what happens is Hashida, his friend, from the start of Steins Gate Zero all the way up until nearly the end of the show, yeah. he's he's saying that we just need Ho and Kyoma to come back. We need We need Okabe to be himself is what he's really saying. But what he yeah. says is they need the mad scientist that he pretended to be to come back because in a way that is the real Okabe. That's, that's when he is at his best when he's putting on the facade and trying to show everyone that, you know, he can make it through these problems. And by putting the act on, he's in full control of himself and he's ready to do what it takes. And at one point after he visits the future accidentally and has to, he, he has to continuously use the phone microwave contraption to go back in time two weeks at a time to get back from the future all the way to his past self again, which means that he has to see a lot of what happened in the future each time he goes back. Yeah. He gets back and he he does one of those nice dramatic little scenes where he tells Hashida to hit him good and hard, which Hashida obliges because he's a bit angry with him anyway. And he's like, well, I, I don't know why, but I guess I will. Yeah. And that's when Okabe wakes up and says, I just needed some sense knocked into me. And he, he starts putting on the Hoenn Kyoma act again. And that's when you know in the show that f you, you kind of get this sense of, well, now it's on. Now he's going to solve this problem because this is where he has come into his full self. This is where he becomes the hero he needs to be to save right. everyone, including Makise, who has been left at the wayside as a corpse this entire time, and Okabe is not going to put up with that anymore. He's going to save her. He will do whatever it takes, no matter how long it takes. His own words, nothing else matters but saving all of his friends. And that is the culmination of his character. Yeah. It doesn't get much better than that for a hero's journey, and the fact that he has to do this all within his own mind most of the time is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what really makes it kind of exciting. It is an incredibly good feeling to get to the stage where you get to see him, because you watched him do it the entire time in the first show. And for almost the entirety of Steins Gate Zero, he has thrown Ho and Kyoma away. He is just the, the broken man who is going to college and is meeting people who once knew Makise and kind of having a, a, a bit of heartbreak from it. Yeah. But when he gets a glimpse at the future and he realizes all of the things that the... It really is Rukako's death that cements it in him. When he has to watch what happens to all of his friends in the future and he gets an opportunity to go back and fix things, that's when he finally decides and that's when... <laughs> you know, Hashida is there when, when he becomes the mad scientist again. And right. I, I think it's... Oh, what's her name? Uh, Maho the other scientist that knew Makise and was kind of oh, a yeah. competitor with her and also her... Right, right. Yeah, yeah. so so Maho is there when he becomes the mad scientist again. She's like, what the heck is all this about? And Hashi just like, no, no, you don't understand. He's going to save us now. He will solve these problems now. This is the this real is exactly what we need. Yeah, this, this is right. what we need to solve this. Be because he does. He, he, he solves all of these problems. Like, in the first show, he gets a little help from Makise, but he essentially solves all of the problems using his own wit and intuition. And yeah. it's, it, for as much of a dope as he might act like with the Mad Scientist Act, you get a sense of him actually being a really intelligent person from what he goes through. Sure. And, and Hashida as well. So the whole thing about them working together and building this time machine only to find out that the girl that came back in time pretending to be John, well, who was John Titer, one of her other missions when she came back in time, uh, her personal mission was to try and find her father, who she didn't know from the in, in the original show. In, in Steins Gate yeah, yeah. Zero, she knows who her father is, so they wrap that up pretty quickly. But mm -hmm. in the original show, she came back and wanted to try and meet her father, and she missed her opportunity. And just to give you an idea of, again, the lengths Okabe goes to, he actually uses the time machine 
to make sure that Suzuhara doesn't leave the current timeline without getting a chance to meet her dad. And they kind of solve a mini mystery in the middle of the show where they discover right. that Hashida, the super hacker who hacks into CERN and uses their computers to figure out how to get their time machine working, he is Suzuhara's father. And during the course of the two shows after they learn that fact, this becomes the one character who, for the most part, Hashida, you know, he, he does that whole act of being a computer nerd. And he continues to do that. He, his character doesn't change too much, but right. you kind of get to see a little more about how much he does for all of his friends and how much he cares because he ends up making a replica of a button that Suzuhara brought back from the future, just trying to make her happy because she said her dad, she got the button from her dad. And so he figured if he could at least bring her a button like that and... I think he was going to tell her a bit of a lie or something about how yeah, he found yeah. it to, to give her, you know, just give her some closure. And in doing so, it turns out that he was the original creator of the button that ended up being given to her. And Mayushi, of all people, who is largely presented as someone outside of the whole time travel thing. She's a bit of an innocent in all of this. Yeah. She's the one who's clever enough to piece everything together. and say oh no you're you're her father he she figures it out yeah by looking at some numbers on the time machine and looking at the badges and just kind of noticing that hashida and suzuharu suzuhara really get on they get on very well she mentions how they they work really well together at one point yeah she she solves the mystery much to everyone's surprise and it it shows a lot of her character because she's always the kind and nurturing one. And a lot of the times the things she says are so subtle, but also very accurate throughout the story, such yeah, as yeah. when she tells them when they're messing around with time travel, she says things like, I kind of don't want you guys to really do this. And I prefer, I prefer if you didn't do anything dangerous she she ends up being spot on with some of the predictions predictions that she makes. She she mentions things in roundabout ways, like how she thinks it's really sad that going from one timeline to another, you're erasing memories that people have with one another. And yeah, she she just finds that really sad. And that is a lot of where the sadder parts of the story come from is that a lot of people don't remember things that happen. So her character and Hashidas are again that you get little bits and pieces about them as time goes on like you learn that in the future Mayushi adopts a child to to save her during the war and you know that she she essentially is the same kind of person in the future that she is in the past but she also knows about all the time travel stuff pretty thoroughly by then and yeah. so so she actually sends this other girl back in time with Suzuhara to try and uh save them both and uh give them both a chance at being happier and trying to change the future. You you don't get you don't get too much out of Mayushi for as well developed as she seems by the end of it, you you really only get her interactions with Okabe where you learn that she she loves Okabe and she's she's aware that Okabe's r really in love with Makise Kurisu and she finds it really sad that, you know, she feels like a burden throughout a lot of the story. She feels like sh she lived and because she lived, uh, she could only live because Makise had uh, died. And so it's her fault that Okabe is burdened with that, because if she had mm -hmm. died, then he would have been able to be with her. But, you know, she's so selfless that it's almost not even a th it's not even an afterthought to her that he's also he would also be in just as much pain losing her as if Makise lived and she died. Right. She's not even aware of all the times that that he had to watch her die until much later in the show. And once that happens, she, she realizes she actually is a lot like Okabe in that sense. When she realizes that he went through this torture of seeing her die over and over and over again, and was willing to sacrifice Maki, well, wasn't really willing to, but had no choice, but to sacrifice Maki say yeah. to keep her alive. She kind of takes matters into her own hands and finds Suzuhara and says, 
look, we need to we need to put a plan together to save everyone because he can't do it. He's not in the right place. And she comes up with a pretty decent idea. So this whole time you're watching, you're thinking that she's she actually talks about herself like she's not one of the intelligent people in the room, but she's actually just by the way she figures figures things out and the uh the things that she comes up with on the very rare occasions you see that she has a lot of insight and forethought and is an intellectual equal to uh the rest of them yeah and uh that's that's kind of a large part of what makes up mayushi you know they're they're childhood friends too so there's a lot of that going on it's it's really well fleshed out in the visual novel i'll leave all of that stuff out for anyone that wants to do a good bit of reading they yeah. do a lot with mayushi and the time travel that just you that's the probably the biggest thing that you never see in the show is the stuff that happens in the past with mayushi and okabe especially when they're kids they mention one part of it very briefly and they don't give you the connection that ties it together that the visual novel gives you uh something about okabe being really sick when he was younger and it's it's kind of described as the same thing that happens whenever his reading Steiner effect kicks in and he realizes yeah. that timeline ch- timelines have changed. So you you know at some point when he was a kid there was a timeline shift, but you, you don't actually get to know what happened in the show. They explain it in the visual novel. And in the movie. Yes, and in the movie as well. Uh, the movie covered a bit of what happened in some of the alternate endings, I think. Right. Hashida's growth was essentially one of his is the funniest growth maybe because most of his growth is okay he's just this guy working as doing really crazy hacking stuff and he's really good at it so you have to assume that he's trained for a lot of it as the story goes on especially in steins gate zero you find out he's got all these other jobs that he does hacker wise that he doesn't talk about because right most of them are probably not on the up and up legally speaking when he hires Kiryu Moeka, you find out that he actually knows her because she was the one person that was able to track him down in all of his hacking stuff, which is quite impressive. So they actually, they don't hit it off in a romantic sense, but they hit it off in a, oh, we're, we're both good at what we do kind of sense. Yeah. So, so he's got like, Hashida has apparently throughout, throughout Akihabara and Tokyo, several different places set up where he can hide and do his hacking thing and he has escape routes planned and all this other stuff in case he ever gets caught you you learn all this extra stuff about him and it's just like oh this is this guy actually has this whole intricate network of things going on and for most of the first show all you saw was him sitting in the dumpy lab being a dumpy person and talking and making lewd jokes essentially in a in a goofy voice yeah and he loses the goofy voice in the future when you get to see him in the future he's much thinner he's uh he's in better shape he's he doesn't make as many of the jokes and he talks in a much more normal voice right but he also does a lot of things that shows he cares about the other characters especially once he finds out Suzuhara is his daughter He'll actually still make the lewd jokes with her and tell her things, tell her things like, oh, yeah, if you could just repeat that, except uh, call me daddy or something like that. And then she'll get annoyed and then he'll laugh about it. So it's it's um, it's interesting to see that he has to form this relationship with his daughter without even getting to see her grow up. It's just like she's almost the same age as him. Right. When she shows up. So. Uh, and and she is calling him dad when no one else is around, which they ha- they have to like modify that. So they they tell everyone that she's his sister whenever there's anyone else around. But she does refer to him as dad, and they do have these uh, these moments where you know they work on the time machine together. Uh, he buys her some uh, some desserts that she really likes, and gives her a good send off when she has to actually go back into the past again. He does a lot to take care of her after he finds out that she's uh, she's her daughter, his daughter. Right. He doesn't have as much at stake as Okabe because he's not as aware of what's going on as Okabe. So you don't get to see what he does for a lot of the other characters. Uh, he he kind of just makes a lot of lewd jokes for the most part. You get to see most of his character development with Suzuhara. He's not even aware most of the time that Mayushi is in danger. Right. 
Uh, so he doesn't have any of these moments where he gets to reflect on any of that because he he's always in a timeline where that's not part of his memories. Let's see. Who else do we need to cover? You brought up Mr. Braun, who he works at the TV Minor shop. Minor but kind but, of fun. Yeah, yeah. He he's a really loving father for his daughter. Who his daughter probably has the least character development in the whole show. She she gets one piece of character development, and that's that she will take charge and force everyone to clean up their messes at parties, and that's it. There's essentially nothing else to her. <laughs> right. They don't even. I don't even think they show her in the future, or if they did, I no. I don't, yeah, I don't think so. No. Yeah. So so she's not she's not a big player, but Mr. Braun, well. <laughs> He's actually an incredibly important part of the story, because it turns out with him, he is actually another one of CERN's agents, and he is the one who hired Kiryu Moeka and sent her on all these missions. She doesn't know that, but uh, he's right. basically running the group that CERN has in that area to discover where all these certain machines are that they need, and... Him being discovered by Okabe at one point is what ultimately leads to... Uh, it, well, he ends up having to kill himself and Kiryu Moeka, because if he doesn't, then CERN is going to anyway. So once he is discovered by Okabe, it, it's kind of a sad moment for him where he spills the, his guts on how he tried to live a normal life, but just ended up in these bad situations. And he really just wants to live for his daughter, and now he can't do that anymore. So he hopes that, you know... She she's never going to find out what he did in his life and hopes that she can move on after he's gone. And then he just offs himself. And so, of course, Okabe has to go back and save him as well. Right. Kind of inadvertently, because really it was telling him that he knew about him that causes him to have to kill himself. So he keeps that information to himself when he goes back and solves the rest of the problems. Right. And that actually comes back to to a bit of prominence in Steins Gate Zero, because he ends up, in order to protect another character, he has to let Mr. Braun know that he knows about the rounders, but then he has to he, he has to be like, look, I know what you do, I, I know all this stuff about time travel, you are not in any danger, nor will you be. I just need you and your resources to help protect this girl, and that's it. And right. if we can just work out a truce in this manner, I will never tell anyone about what you are, you and your daughter can live in peace, and I will, I, I think, I don't know if they did it in the show, I think he says something in the visual novel to the effect of he will do whatever he can to protect them. Yeah. So, Mr. Braun, who is usually the one protecting others, he, he agrees to this, and, and so now for the rest of Science Gate Zero, he is actually aware of everything that Okabe is doing, and the fact that there's time travel involved, and there's all these other organizations uh, he supplies Okabe with a lot of the information he needs to solve the problems that come up in Steins Gate Zero. Right. I I think I think maybe we can we can do multiple episodes of this if we want to kind of talk about the story more and may, maybe get into some of the other characters a bit more deeply. In, in doing this rush job, I guess there there's just so much to these characters and what happens in the show. We didn't really get too much of a chance to talk about how these characters are made to be so well developed throughout the show, because this really is a case of essentially you get five minutes of character development for each of the side characters that are not Okabe in the show, but it's incredible character development. Yeah. So we did a lot about Okabe. Maybe we can try and tackle more about the other characters in a second episode. Do you think? Yeah, maybe. Because we're, we're we're hitting we're close to the two hour mark. So if you wanna, if you've got anything you'd like to say, since I talked this entire time and my throat's going. <laughs> no, I I mean I think I think you know, you know it's it's one of those things where the characters are all developed bit by bit in you know in 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 little pieces here and there and. It's a really effective technique because it it helps make it feel more natural. There's not there's not ever any point where any character sits down and, and spills their entire backstory to somebody. You learn it in bits and pieces. I think that's the, the takeaway here is that Oh yeah, there is, is almost that, no plot dump in Steinsgate. Yeah. And and you'd think that there would be because there's so much data being dumped into poor Rintaro's brain over and over again. But 
yeah, it's just one of those stories that works out really well because of the way that it's paced and the way that characters are revealed to you bit by bit. I, I think that's the I think that's the the real thing to learn here, uh, because because what we want is we want to focus on technique and not you know you know spoil every element of the plot of Steins Gate necessarily. So, so, so what yeah, is the I technique mean, then? What, what what is the technique? Well, we're well looking the, at the, here? the technique is the technique is being patient about developing your characters. You don't need to have them all do something amazing the first time you see them. Uh, you can have them have some negative traits, and then you can later on soften or eliminate those negative traits as you as you uh, as you see fit. You know. And, and and as you were talking about this, most of the most of the character development happens because character X is interacting a certain way with character Y, as opposed to, you know, some character going off on their own and doing everything by themselves and, and being quote unquote developed that way, right? So, you know, it's one of those things where people often want to rush character development. Like you'll find this in a lot of TV shows, for instance, where every single episode has to have some climactic confrontation between, you know, some character and some other character. There's a lot of, there's a lot of really, really fast paced, like hyper drama that doesn't necessarily mean that the characters are going to be well developed, especially because everything gets, you kind of end up in a, in a positive feedback spiral where you have to just get more and more bombastic every single time you want to introduce something. And so things become things rapidly spiral out of control in that in that sense. Whereas in this show, in this in this visual novel series, you have a lot of you have a lot of really really slow and piecemeal character development, and you have a lot of it happening because characters are cooperating and not because some character X is character Y's sworn enemy and they have to fight each other kind of thing. You know, it's it's kind of the opposite of there was that awful Batwoman show. Oh, I don't know much about that. I, I don't know but that yeah, much I, about it, but I've I've seen I've seen some people talk about it. I've seen a lot of clips of 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 it and, and and analysis of those clips. And basically, the idea was that every single episode there was some kind of massive shift to the point where things just kind of didn't make sense. You had characters getting, you know, characters teleporting around and things like that, and everything was very bombastic. Whereas, and and, and what happens is that you know that can be kind of fun at first but in the end people kind of get inured to it they, they you know there's so much happening that they kind of get uh like overstimulated maybe is maybe the right word and 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 it no longer has much of an effect whereas if you if you're careful and patient and and you know do these things with some care and some time allowed for characters to breathe in between you can end up with a much better result. You can end up with something that, you know, was a an award-winning visual novel that spawned a couple of, you know, additions and sequels uh, and uh, and and two, you know, two television shows that both had, you know, the effect the 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 uh the uh, effectively half a year of of show each plus a movie. You know, it, it's one of those things where things things were done slowly so that when things happen fast and when things happen importantly, those things really have impact, as opposed to kind of just having the TV screen blare at you for thirty minutes over and over and over again. There's a lot of there's a lot of room to breathe, and that's really important in making characters in in both developing characters so that they're realistic and in developing characters so that the reader kind of picks up on these things themselves, as opposed to feeling spoon fed. Which can also be a negative, you know. Yeah, and there's also it, you have to remember when you're doing when you're approaching these things, you don't have to stick with. You know, it's great that everything is slowly revealed over time to develop a character. Now, it's not this isn't something that you have to do. You can you can do the plot dump character explanation and then make the important part of the uh, story the adventure that this character has. It yeah. definitely helps if you do it in a way that isn't obnoxious to the reader. Like just filling three pages of information about this character and then sending them on their adventure would probably bore someone. But you can introduce large chunks and pretty decently sized just dumps but, of information the, the, at the, the beginning. The point is, is that if you just if you just do that, eventually the reader gets 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 too uh, gets bored with that because it's just a constant. 
it's a constant air horn in their face, you know. Yes, and so, it, so 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 having a good having a bit of a mix there, having some breathing room is really the important is 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 the important point because, I mean, this is true of uh, of uh, of the characters in the Good Guy, right? You learn a little bit about each of them each chapter, and they have some bombastic fight scenes and stuff like that. But those fight scenes remain interesting because every time one of them happens, you're learning something a little bit new about one or more of the characters. Well, thanks for the plug. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's what we're here for. Well, one of us had to bring yeah, it up, I, didn't we? <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where, like, you know, you see the current trend. The current trend is to is to blare at people. And, yeah. you know, it, it's way more effective, you know, if you blare at people only 5% of the time. And then the rest of the time you're a little bit more careful because if you just blare at people, eventually they just put their fingers in their ears, you know? Yeah, and it helps if you if you know what what the approach is going to be for your story. Like it works really well. This is a time travel story. So things being right. revealed to you piece by piece is is much better in that atmosphere because if you know everything at the beginning of a time travel story or if you think you know everything at the beginning of a time travel story and you find out you're right, then yeah. having it be a time travel story is kind of boring. Whereas even if they give you all the information at the beginning of a time travel story, and as you see the time travel happen, you realize that the information is not what you think it is, that is much more interesting. And also, it, another thing to remember about Steinsgate in particular, having most of the story show up through the focal point of Okabe Rintaro gives you, gives you glimpses at other characters that can be much more effective than if you had been in their perspective or in like a sort of third person perspective of all the characters, because yeah. you have to see, you have to see what's revealed about each character through Okabe's eyes. In most cases, right. this is, this is a good way to do it. If you're writing a first person story, if you're writing a third person story that sticks to one character for the majority of it, this is also a good way, but you know, you can you can think of it in terms of let's say you're writing a story. Let, let's let's pull some fantasy stuff. You're writing a story about a fantasy thief character, and you just give a plot dump at the beginning of oh, it's this very agile character who was brought up in the circus or something or some kind of thing that required some just gymnastic ability, and he learned to pick locks from this person at the at the circus or that person at you know just or just learned it on their own just to be able to survive it has all these skills from surviving on the streets as some poor beggar child and grew up to become a thief because they had no moral compass yada 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 whereas okay, you see everybody you see how bad that sounded yeah yeah whereas you can you can tell a story and you you show the character going down a dark alley and looking over their shoulder and pulling some tools out of their pocket and fiddling with the door. And this establishes that this character is a pickpocket. And, you know, as the story goes on, you know, maybe a third of the way through or even halfway or even all the way at the end, you know, you can play around with the timing of it. But, you know, at some point you you have the character reflect on the way their master taught them to pick locks. And then it's like, oh, OK, so this person learned from someone. And you don't just you don't just have to have the plot dump of, Hi, I'm X character, and I learned my trade from so and so back at the hut, the, the the thieving hut where all thieving things were learned. Well, I think I think you're getting too far into like a caricature. Like like we need we need actual examples of things where this has happened, right? Like I gave the Batwoman example, but like I mean, it, I, at some point we get to the point where we're just saying things that are way too obvious for people, and and maybe it's not so helpful. But like, it's important to connect the obvious things to what we talked about. Yeah. I, Okabe doesn't at any point tell you everything about himself. You learn about his past with Mayushi as the story progresses. You learn about why he, why Mayushi is called his hostage uh, from a funny little moment that takes place in the story. Yeah. That, that gives you some insight as to why Okabe does the things he does. You learn about Makise's research into time travel, which is a counterpoint to to her actual belief that time travel is possible, and that leads into a backstory of hers later on in the show where you find out she she had presented this time travel stuff to her father, and he kind of shot her down and made her feel bad about it, and only right. only to end up later on stealing her research because he actually 
came to the conclusion that it was viable. Uh, you learn about... I'm, I'm trying to think of a good one for Hashida. He makes a lot of lewd jokes, and he will continue making those lewd jokes for a very long time. But in his way, he has a lot of very subtle development in the sense that when you get to glimpse him just briefly in the future, it's like, oh, what happened to this guy? Because he was kind of this fat slob who made lewd jokes and talked in a funny voice. Yet in the future, he's this brilliant inventor of a time machine and he he's much skinnier. He's a, he actually works out a lot, and he's uh, he stands up straight. He talks clearly, and he is a very good father to Suzuhara. So uh, there's a lot of development that just you you fill it in in your head, but you know it happened, and you you have to kind of look at the events that took place between then and now, or or then in the future to figure, okay, what caused him to have these big changes? And um, there's no definite conclusions there, but you can make assumptions about how he needed to be a good... Fi he knows his future. He he needs to be able to, uh, to be in shape to handle what's coming. He needs to be able to be a good father so that he can teach his daughter the things she needs to know to go into the past. Uh, Suzuhara is an amazing hand-to-hand -hand fighter. She had to have learned that from somewhere probably from Rukako in the future, but her father is also in much better shape in the future and undoubtedly taught her a few things here and there about what she would need to know from what he experienced with her in the past. Yeah. So so his character, more than anyone's, probably comes full circle because he's the only one in the show that... I, we don't even know much about what Okabe does in the future. We only get to see the few things that he knows once he makes that short visit. But but Hashida is burdened with knowing almost his exact future. And uh, in, in one of the timelines, it's established that Mayushi and Okabe are both dead, and he's the last man standing and has to send his daughter back in time. He also right. has to deal with the fact that at some point, he's going to have to let his daughter go and send her into the past for this to happen. So he knows the exact day at which is going to be his last day that he gets to spend with his daughter in the future. And uh they they don't they don't really show you much of any uh any of what he has to struggle with in that sense, but it is a part of his character that the reader or the the viewer is aware of. Right. So so you don't even necessarily have to have this be a development for the character for it to have impact on the reader. So just just dropping these subtle things along the way, just, you know, Mayushi's sudden ability to play detective and figure out who Suzukara's father is tells you a lot more about what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, when you learn a little more about her past and the things that her and Okabe went through, you uh, you get a better glimpse at what kind of person she is. Uh, Moeka starts off as someone who just seems really, really sheltered and shy and ends up being a top-notch uh, agent and assassin for a large segment of CERN's evil organization yeah. wing. Yeah, it, It's it's a lot better than if you... I mean, if you had received all of this information up front about all these characters, the show would not have been worth watching. Right. It would have been a good proof of concept for a show that would have been better if you hadn't known everything from the start. Right, right. So I think that's that's our takeaway. Um, character development. Be patient. Have some have some important points here and there, but also don't be afraid to to trickle things a little bit for people and and give them a little bit of things where they have to make some inferences on their own. Too. Oh, oh, you know what? Uh, I I can give a good example. Okay. Just last night, I started working on one of my side stories for the vampire thing, mm -hmm. and it, it's going to be about Urzgelda's assassin her personal assassin, now that they're not murderous vampires anymore in that universe, yeah, she has to find new work. And Urzgelda's solution is, well, I'm going to be going away with Ray Peril and Silence for a while because we've apparently figured out how to travel to different worlds. So we're going to need someone to be in charge of the vampires. And the only vampire that's left was that really is really the best vampire for the job 
is Guadal from the beginning of The Good Guy, the vampire that is gigantic and monstrous and Ray Peril beats up. And yeah. nobody's seen him since that happened, but rumor has it he didn't actually die because Ray Peril didn't actually kill him. He left him there to either live or die. And you never hear about him after that. So so I, I kind of use that to say, okay, your mission as my personal assassin who likes taking missions from me, and that's that's kind of her thing. Her character is that she she does Erzgelda's bidding and she doesn't know what to do if she doesn't have that. Right. Uh, she's going to go hunt for Guadal and let him know that he's the Viscount of Vampires in the absence of Erzgelda. Uh -huh. And it's... It's just a short little fun thing I'm going to write, but it's, I, I started writing it and I ended up with a lot of kind of plot dumping my way into the parts that I wanted to get to because I wasn't sure how I wanted to start it. So I had a scene yeah. with her and her Gelda talking and they discussed a lot of the things about why Guadal would be the best choice. They, I opened it with a scene of, uh, the character's name is Florietta. She is... Uh, she's working as one of the maids in Galenia for the new queen, and she hears some characters arguing about uh, the appointments that the queen is making, like General Kiern is going to be the head of the military, and they're like, well, he's the guy that, you know, he did all those horrible things in the valley, and now he's just going to be given this big appointment, and so she shows up, and they he, he hears them smack-talking Erzgelda and all this other stuff, and she kind of interrupts everyone and explains to them, that, well, no, we're all kind of guilty of a lot of things. I mean, I'm an assassin, and that's, her, her introduction is as this... I, I give a lot of description of who she is in her introduction. I wasn't satisfied with it, and I rarely do this, but I'm going back and I'm rewriting the whole thing as her just wandering from place to place and dropping hints about who she is and what she's doing as it goes along. And mm -hmm. I can't believe I didn't think of that to talk about while we were talking about all this, but it kind of it kind of fits the bill. I wasn't happy with even for a short story, giving that much of a plot dump. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to go back and kind of sprinkle it in as she goes from place to place, hunting down Guadal. Right. So yeah, use this in your own writing, and if if you think a plot dump is necessary, keep it keep it small. Don't don't wall of text your readers to boredom. Well, don't don't don't, don't do it often. Do it, make it be a surprise. Just try to think about, is it ever really, do you really ever want to give away everything? Like, like think about the right. movies you've watched, the books you've read. The... Well, no, no, no one ever gives away everything. But the, the point is that, the point is that there's, there's value in making, in, 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 not just in having a good pace, but in having a pace that varies a little bit here and there, right? That, that, that's the point, is that the, this variation is something that, that helps draw, draw readers in. Yeah, it's, in it's more fun to not, learn. Not, not everything is, is white knuckle gripping the sides of your chair. There's a little room to breathe here and there. Yeah, and it's, and it's much that. more fun to learn a little bit about the characters as they go along than to know everything about them up front and just watch the story unfold. And so it's like, okay, I knew this character was going to do this because they said they could do that at the beginning of the book. I, right. I I don't have anything to look forward to. It's like, oh, this is what's going to happen next. Don't make it predictable, of course. Predictable books. I mean, obviously, sometimes it will be. There's things that you want to be predictable. I certainly wanted things to be predictable in a couple of the stories I wrote. But uh, just try to pace yourself. Try to figure out what important information about your character the reader needs to know at that moment and what you can do to present it in a very fun way. Uh, when they need to know the next thing. Right. Okay. I think that that counts as a pretty solid episode. A very long one, for sure. Yes, indeed. Um, I, I, I promise I'll let you talk next time. I don't know what got into me, but it's Steins Gate. How can I not talk about Steins Gate? No, that's fair. <laughs> I, I don't know. We're going to have to go back and look at the clock on this one. I think I might have had you at a complete silence for over an hour at one point. I think something like that, possibly, yeah. Aside from the occasional yeah or uh-huh. Yeah, so... so That's all right. I'll cut that all out. Yeah, just, just cut out everything I said. No, I mean, I'm going to get rid of all the plot details. Yeah. And only, only the part where we talk about abstract concepts is, is what's going to make it in. So this is actually going to be one of our shortest episodes. Because we only did that for five minutes at the very end. Make it exactly the length of the convergence meter. 
at at the end of uh, Steins Gate. So it's going to be like 1.6 minutes or something. <laughs> that would be rather difficult. <laughs> All right. Until next time. Yes. Until next time. We are the Wordy Pair, and thank you for listening. As always, I'm Rudy. And I'm Justin. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Wordy Pair Podcast. Our passion is all things writing, world building, and getting into the weird and wonderful world of fiction. We hope you enjoyed our unique takes. If you did, make sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe to get your weekly dose of writing weirdness. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on Twitter. For Rudy, it's at Rudolph underscore Cone. And for Justin, at Ninja Mouse Chew. See you next time on the Wordy Pear Podcast.